14 verses 12 through 14. <clears throat> Luke chapter 14 verses 12 through 14 and it reads, Then Jesus said to his hosts, When you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or your relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. So this morning I want to talk about the island of misfit toys. Uh, if you've seen the uh, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer uh, cartoon, you might recognize it, uh, where all of the toys that were uh, deformed, lame, and blind were, were cast away from all of the good ones. And in this analogy, the island obviously is God's house and the toys are God's children. What's interesting about God's kingdom or his household is that it doesn't consist of those who are good. It consists of those who are poor and blind and lame and crippled. Uh, it, the key for us is to understand that that's who we are. That's who we were. And that if we forget that, it's very easy to then become kind of puffed up or conceited. Um, you know, I, in the last um, you know, couple of decades or so, I've um, gotten to you know, know a lot of business people in the communities both here and in where we had been in California. Um, and, and I've been privileged enough to have some people say some really nice things about me, to me, um, that my part of my brain is just going, you don't really understand, <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, it's not, this it isn't me, you know, it, it's, uh, I'm different than I used to be, and that only came about because of God and His teaching, and to understanding that and never losing sight of that, I always feel a little bad for those who grow up as a child and everything kind of goes right. They're, they have this really wonderful family. They kind of get, you know, do well at school. They go get a really good job. Now, very few people actually have idyllic childhoods into adulthoods, yeah, but it does happen. You know, there's a really strange kind of phenomenon that psychologists or psychiatrists deal with. Typically, when somebody goes in expressing they're having difficulty in life, depression or some other Thing, what happens is they begin to probe and search for the pain. They begin to try and find what kind of trauma you have mentally and little memories that kind of are sticking with you. Um, and, and on occasion, they actually find people who, at least in their own mind, their, their young life and their childhood was so idyllic that their adult life doesn't match. And that their depression comes from never being as good. They don't feel as good. They don't feel competent. And that things are not as wonderful as they thought they should be. And so it brings about depression. Um, and, and I feel bad for people who seem to skate through easily because they never re really have that time where they realize I'm broken and until you realize you're broken you can't be healed by God and that's why his kingdom is full of the mystics the outcasts those whom everybody else says ah, I don't really want them in in fact when you go if you when you look at the passage that was um, read for us already and kind of expand out on it a little bit in Luke 14. He actually tells it a couple different times and a couple different ways um, to the man who had invited him to this uh, feast at his house. He's telling him, you know, just you need to invite those who have been, you know, who are the outcasts. 
Well, who are outcasts? Are you, are you an outcast? Do you think of yourself as an outcast? You probably not, maybe in this, our, our group. Are you at work? Have you been at school? Now, I'm guessing a lot of us have never really been the outcast. I mean, in, in, a, in a kind of societal way. That we have been kind of the people that fit in. You know, maybe we're pretty good students. Maybe, you know, we kind of have friends. And, but if you think about your workplace, maybe your schools, sometimes even our homes, there are members of those groups who don't fit in. And the rest just don't accept them. Especially true of children, right? <laughs> Anybody a little different with kids, they tend to kind of, you know, run screaming from them and, you know, and, and kids can get really isolated because of it. But everybody can different ways can be that outcast. And if you've never felt that, never felt like you just didn't fit in there, then you don't maybe grasp it as easily. But most of us in our, in our lifetime will probably have felt it in some way. There'll be different times in our lives when maybe we just didn't fit. We didn't know how to fit, and we couldn't fit, and we weren't accepted. And God is calling out to you and saying, come home to me. I'm here for you. Now, that we never, we must never forget who we were. Um, we remember and talk about sometimes that we're different now, we're special, we're God's people, and that needs to mean something in the way we act, the way we talk. But we need to not forget who we were. In Psalm 51, this psalm, by the way, of David's, he wrote after prophet Nathan had come to him to highlight and expose the sins he had committed with Bathsheba in adultery, but also in killing her husband. And after that was exposed, David wrote Psalm 51. And he says in the beginning, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Now, I don't know how difficult it would be for somebody who has killed someone to then approach God and say, please forgive me. I haven't had that experience. David has. David had it a lot, actually. But he approached him and said, please, God, forgive me. According to your steadfast love, there's that word I've been talking to you for a while, Hebrew word has said, which means a whole bunch of stuff, kindness, mercy, love, grace, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a word that doesn't translate real well. Sometimes it says, you know, loving kindness, sometimes mercy, sometimes steadfast love, a whole bunch of different things. But he says, because of who you are, have mercy on me. Because of your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. And by the way, when this happens... And there are passages we could turn to and look at. We ought to understand that God has cleansed us. We should know that. That we have approached Him, we have asked Him. He has told us when we do certain things, He will forgive us. We should believe Him. That when we have done those things, He has forgiven us. But that doesn't mean we forget what we did. He says, for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. He says, David could, in a sense, never forget what he had done. He could accept that God had forgiven him. He could seek God's forgiveness. But he could never not be the guy who committed adultery with Bathsheba and took Uriah's wife from him and killed him. He can never be that guy who didn't do that. And so, 
for all of us. The things we have done, the sins we have committed, the people whom we've hurt. We can never be the people who didn't do those things. But we can be people who are forgiven of those things. So my sin is ever before me. I know it. I understand it. I know what I was. I was broken. And still, I'm broken. I'm not attained. None of us in this life are truly going to attain to that perfection that maturity that God really is seeking for us. In Luke 14 there, 13, 14, when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. That's what Jesus was doing. That's who we are. And until, until we realize that, and see one of the, sometimes, because we might be smart, we might be good looking, we might do good work, we sometimes get deceived into thinking, oh, we're really pretty good people. When you compare me with everybody else around here, I'm pretty good people. But God's not really comparing us with everybody else. He's comparing us with His Son. And by that standard, we all fail. We all fall. And so He says, you'll, you're going to be blessed because they can't repay you. That's us. We can't repay God, can we? Which one of us, I don't want you to think, be honest with yourself, which one of us, if you could, if there was some way for you to repay God for what He's done for you, how hard would you work to do that? I think a lot of us would, right? We're like, I, I want to repay Him. I, I don't want to be in the debt anybody's debt. I want it to be all on me. But that's exactly the opposite of what God's grace is about. God says, you can't do it. It's all on me. In Isaiah 61, verse 1, prophecy about Jesus and about His coming that Jesus Himself read in a synagogue as He began to preach about the kingdom coming to the Jews, he said, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. That word for good news here, really, in the New Testament, translated into Greek of the New Testament, is the gospel. That's what the gospel is. The gospel is poured out for all of those people who recognize they are the poor, the lame, the crippled. That's who we were. Ideally, we are changing. We are being transformed by God Himself, by the power that works through Christ. What we're living for. We need to not forget who we were, but we also need to not forget why we came to Him. And I think that sometimes that that is, I don't know if it's, it's normal, but I think sometimes people can kind of get a, a feeling that, listen, I've been, I've been worshiping and following God, going to church for five decades or six decades, and look how righteous I am, look how good I am. And that that, that is something that can set in. I, I don't know in what percentage, but... You see that happen sometimes to people that feel like they've just been going and, and, and trying to serve God for so long that, that that's somehow some badge of honor or, or badge of righteousness. And forgetting, much like 2 Peter chapter 1 talks about in that passage in 2 Peter 1 where he says, you know, we need to add to our faith, virtue, virtue, knowledge, knowledge, self-control, self-control, perseverance, perseverance, godliness, godliness, self-control, self-control, brotherly love, brotherly godliness, brotherly love, and then love. He says, if you do keep doing all those things, keep adding all those things, then your entrance into the heavenly kingdom is sure. But, he says, if you don't, you have forgotten and you're back to being blind again. And that, that, that is a, a danger. 
that it is a danger for us to forget what we had been and why we are trying to grow and to grow out of and be transformed from our brokenness. Now, here in Ephesians chapter 2, I want to read this passage here from 1 through 10. Uh, there's a couple of passages we're going to look at this morning. But this one, start here in Ephesians 2, starting in verse 1. He's going to tell us we're, we were just like everybody else. The rest, rest of everybody. But now we are the workmanship of Christ. The workmanship of God. God has made us who we are. If we are truly His, if we have heard His message, if we have responded and replied to that message, then we are what He has done, not what we have done. And so He says, You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of a disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. Anybody here have any children who are by nature children of wonderfulness? <laughs> no, children are difficult. They're a pain oftentimes. They bring, they bring moments of wonder, wonderfulness and joy, but children need wrath. <laughs> they beg for wrath at times almost. And it's like, it's like you sometimes see a child, a little young child, they just, and, and they just they, they start acting out in such a way that you realize you haven't been disciplined in a while, have you? <laughs> You're just kind of begging for it. That's who we all were. That's who every child, every young person is. We were all that. And he says, just like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by his grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. Not a result of your actions or your works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship. He has done this to us. We were created in Christ Jesus for good actions, good behaviors, good deeds, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. To be loving and kind and gentle and mercy, merciful, to be a hard worker, to be diligent, trustworthy, and honest. These are all kind of components are the things God has always taught people that we ought to put on. And he says, we are the ones that were made like this for him. He's the one that taught us this. He's the one that instructed us in this. Because think about this. If you just took your child that was, you know, three years old, and you just kind of let them do whatever they wanted to do, whenever they wanted to do it. How well would that go to adulthood? <laughs> without, without any teaching, without any training, without any structure, without any you know, guidelines, without any you know, guiding them and saying, well, no, no, don't do that. <laughs> Come over here. Without all of that stuff... Kids get in trouble, don't they? In fact, the, 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 anybody, how many people have read the, the book, The Lord of the Flies? A handful of, um, you know, it's kind of about, you know, this 
get these kids on, on, all marooned together, and, and so they kind of create their own little society. Is it a wonderful, just beautiful, loving society? No, not at all. Kids don't do that to each other. That they're, they're not by nature just, you know, helping and, and looking for the weakest and the outcast and the, who needs help the most. That's not what kids do by their nature. That's something we have to learn to, because that is God's nature, not man's nature. And that's something we have to learn to be like Him. So one other passage I want to look at, and that in Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, start in verse 10. Um, Well, I had another lecture time this morning. So let me, let me start actually in verse 1, uh, Philippians 3. He says, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus. Put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. He was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. He says, so when you, when you took him in relationship to this idea of being in the flesh before God, did, any, was, did anybody have any better, you know, resume than Paul? No. But he says, that was all rubbish. <laughs> did, did all that stuff mean Paul wasn't broken? No. Paul recognized he was broken. Now, it took Christ <laughs> coming and blinding him to recognize he was broken. But he finally realized... I thought I was doing all the right stuff, and, and I wasn't. And so he gave all that up that he might know Christ. He says, indeed, in verse 8, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. What do you think that, what does that mean? I count everything loss to know Jesus Christ. Is, there, is, is, is your house more important than knowing Christ? No. Bank accounts? No. Family? Kids? Hard, huh? But Christ surpasses all of it. Better than all of it. In fact, not only is Christ better than all those things... Christ helps us with all those things. When we have Christ and when we know Christ, we have a much greater and more positive influence on every other relationship we have, family, friends, work, school. It's influenced in a good way. That doesn't mean everybody is going to like it. <laughs> but it, you become a positive influence for godliness. And he says, in order that I might, well, see, for his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. He says, so when, when, when you see me in Christ, it isn't going to be because, wow, look at all, look at all these wonderful you know, laws he kept. He's going to go, this guy trusted in Jesus. Which ultimately, by the way, is in the law as well. <laughs> the, law, the law didn't say you didn't, did, didn't need God. But... He goes on and he says, 
um, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. He goes, I want to be raised with God. That is the ultimate goal of my life, Paul writes. Now, from here he goes on, and he's going to tell us that we need to follow this. That we need to imitate what he has said. He says, not that I have already or have already obtained this, or am, or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own. And by the way, perfect doesn't mean here the way we tend to use it. Like how many of us we have ever heard or, or said ourselves, uh, who's, nobody's perfect. And what we mean is nobody is without flaw, nobody's without sin. That's not exactly what he means. The word perfect in Scripture does not really mean without sin. It really means something that has grown to its kind of fullness or its maturity. And you can kind of think about, think about, think about a plant or, or a tree of some sort. You plant it and, you know, it's kind of young and, and small and maybe it's a fruit tree and it's like not producing any fruit. It's like, well, it's not really mature yet, is it? It's not perfect. But years later, years and years go by and it grows and it matures and it, and it starts producing the most wonderful fruit and, and it's not really, and it's, it's reached its full height. And all you do really now is prune it, right? And take, glean the fruit from it. It's perfect. That's the idea of perfect that scripture is talking about. And Paul is saying, I'm not there yet. I've got, I've got stuff that needs to be kind of snipped away from my life, cut off of me. I, I'm not, I keep pressing on. He says, I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Because I was broken, because he called me who was an outcast, I have come to him and I am asking him to help me grow. To help me overcome my weakness. Help me overcome my brokenness. That I might reflect who he was. And he says, Brothers, I do not consider I've made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. Now, I said we don't want to forget who we were. But we do want to forget the path. We don't want to keep rehashing. We, we, we ought to know what we were. But we don't. The problem with the past, sometimes we get stuck reliving it, don't we? All those, those things we did, those, those, those bad things that we have done in our life or, or to hurt other people, Sometimes they, they replay in our memory, and we kind of get stuck replaying them. I don't need to get stuck replaying them. God knows I did them. I know I did them. I know I was flawed, and, and I've got to press on. Don't get stuck looking at all that. Don't get stuck thinking about and reliving it. Know who we were. Don't forget who we were, but then go, that's why I press on. Who I was is why I'm moving forward. I'm going to press on. I'm going to keep going to do and become like what Jesus was. And so he says, but I strain forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal. What's the goal? goal the goal word here means like the finish line. Like if you're running a race, right, there's a little, they put up a tape or something, especially your first, or a line on, on, that you cross. That's the goal. In football, you got a goal line, right? You get across that goal line, and what happens when you cross the goal? He says, you get the prize. He's press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call. 
The prize is the upward call of God. God saying, come here, come to me, my good and faithful child. That's the prize, that he will call us home. The goal line is our death. Or, if he comes, and we're all changed in an instant, it's still the end of our flesh and the, se and the separation of our spirit from this flesh. And he says, but that's the goal. To the very end, to the very last of my breath, to the very last of my strength, I press on. That I want the prize of God calling me up says, let those of us who are mature think this way. So if you've got maturity, if you're not like a babe, you need to think like this. I've got, remember a few weeks ago I talked about the passage in, in Psalm 90 that talks about teach us to number our days. Has that been, just a real quick thought, see a show of hands. Did anybody actually calculate how many days they think they have left? I guess I'm weird. So, um, I just use, you know, like average lifespan. I, you know, I, I don't have any other insight. <laughs> but, um, you know, we got so many more opportunities to live here, to do things. I don't know how many they are, but we all have that. We all have a limited, finite number of opportunities to really live in this world. What are we going to do with them? He says, but those who are mature need to think, here's how many I've got, and I'm going to live them all until I don't have any more breath left. Then he says, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal this, that also to you. Now, I know for those who are young, it's hard to think like that. It seems, I mean, you've been, you've been alive for like 10 years. 70 years seems like eternity. <laughs> you know, if you have 70 more years, like, you can't even hardly fathom that when you're 10. <laughs> now, you get 50, and it's not as hard to fathom the rest of the years. Right? Because you've already lived more than you're going to live. But when you have it, when you live a short amount of time, it's hard to see that. So when you're, when you're, when you're kind of young and a babe in Christ, or you're young... In years, it's hard to see the goal line. It's not as clear. It's not as in focus. It's, it still seems way, way far off. That's why one of the reasons I, in our class, um, was it last week, week before, we talked a little bit about the effect that funerals have when they're for young people. When, when young people die, it impacts a lot of people because there's a lot of young people who know them, and it has just an impact. And, and because all the young people that knew them can't imagine themselves dying. And then all of a sudden, somebody they knew, somebody they were close to, dies, and, and it's kind of a, an alert. You get older, and you, and you get more and more accustomed. More and more people you know die. More and more people you have known. More and more people you will know. I, can, I, and I remember this years and years ago. I thought it was just so creepy back, way back when. When my mom, back when there were real papers, people got and read and their obituaries listed in there and you know we lived in a fairly sizable town uh, the area we obviously I grew up in was you know what, 10 times or more the, the size of this valley um, but my mom in our hometown paper would read see all the obituaries and you know she, in her 40s 50s and kind of go oh I know them oh, she, so it start, she as she got older and older she realized she knew more and more people listen to the obituaries and, and and it hit her, kind of kept, her, kept reminding her, wow, I'm getting closer and closer to that. And so he says in verse 17, well, and let me read verse 16 first. Uh, Only let us hold true to what, to what we have attained. We need to hold on to this, what we have attained in Christ, having become a Christian, having become a, a, an adopted child of God's. We need to hold on to that. 
And he says, brothers, join in imitating me. Keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you, even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Why do you think he says there's a whole bunch of people there that walk as enemies of the cross of Christ and he does, them, does it with tears? How many of them... How many of them do you think he personally knows who are enemies of the cross of Christ? Paul came from a pretty influential family who most likely had wealth, position, power. His, his nephew is the one that alerted him to a plot to kill him because he happened to be around when leaders of the nation were plotting to kill him. How did his nephew end up in the same place that the leaders of the nation were plotting to kill him, or leaders of the people. It tells you some of the connections that his family ran in. And a lot of them could have been his own siblings, family, that were the enemies of the cross, which is probably why he could think about it, and it would bring tears to his eyes. And so... He says, their end is destruction. Whereas, he says, the end for us, the goal line, is the upward call. He says, their end, their, what happens after they pass the finish line, is destruction. And he says, their God is their belly. And the, the belly kind of represents just everything about us that kind of revels in the moment, that likes stuff, you know, whether, whether it's, you know, gorging on wonderful food or, you know, it kind of reminds me a little bit of, of Thanksgiving Day. Usually it's kind of a gorgeful day for lots of people. Um, or, but, or, or you're just kind of gorging on life and the, and the things that, that it has, that very often all they're really living for is how can I fill and taste and do more? I just want as much as I can get. This is the, they're just they're living for satisfying their own flesh. That's how they live. That's what they're doing. And he says, and their glory is their shame, with minds set on earthly things. I can think of a lot of examples of people who have been glorying in things that are shameful especially in the last generation or so, really since the 60s. A lot of people have been kind of parading around, glorifying things that are shameful. And they've known it. They've been parading and doing all of this in the face of all of those, you know, the generation before them that considered them bad and sinful. And it wasn't enough just that they weren't going to listen. They, did, they wanted to do more than just not listen. They wanted to... Throw it in their face. And they wanted a glory on all those things that people said, that's shameful. That's terrible. And then he says, with minds set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like His glorious body, by the power that enables Him even to subject all things to Himself. So we will be transformed into be like Him because of His power. Not us. It's not in us. It's not in our power. But it is in His power. And so He has given us all this stuff and said, I know that you're misfits. I know that you're outcasts. I know that you don't fit in. I know that you're broken. You're poor and blind, blind and lame. But come to me, and I will bandage you up. I will heal you. And I will transform you. And that's what we're living for. Passage. In Galatians 2 and verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. 
And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's what Paul wrote about himself. And I think for there are times that many of us probably could say that about ourselves. But I suspect that there's a lot of times when we realize that we're not really doing this. That it's more us living for ourselves than living for God. Because we tend to kind of have moments of strength, moments of faith, moments of weakness. But you just keep growing. You just keep adding. Like 2 Peter 1 talks about, you just keep adding to the faith and the virtue and the knowledge and the perseverance and the patience and all that stuff. He said, just keep adding to it. He didn't, he didn't ask you... He says, well, you can't come until you're fully there. He didn't say that. He says, as long as, you're, as long as you keep growing, as long as you just keep trying to get a little better, I'll be with you. And if you're here today, we're going to close out here in just a moment. But 